Hello, YouTube people. And we are broadcasting on Zencaster, and I'm hitting the intro now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Script and Style Show. I'm Todd Gardner from TrackJS, and my co-host, David Walsh, creator of the popular blog, DavidWalsh.name. How's it going today, David? I'm awesome, Todd. How are you? I am very well. I was sick for a couple of weeks there, but we're back on the recording train again. You pulled it back in? Yeah, everything's back together, and we have all kinds of new stuff to share this week. Yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. Um, usually we have what Todd and I call the banter section, but there's no banter this time because we... we it's, all, thought, it's all meat. It's we, all good we, stuff to share this time. We're huge now. We're stars. Um, we've got the new scriptandstyle.com website. Boom. We are on iTunes like real professionals. We're on Spotify. We're on Stitcher. We're all over the place now. We're even on Google Play. Oh, man. Does anybody use Google Play to listen to podcasts? I don't know. I didn't know they did that, but what I <laughs> told you is that I told my wife we were doing this podcast on YouTube, and she was unfazed. But now that we're on iTunes, like her favorite murder mystery podcast, like I'm, I'm a celebrity in the house. Yeah, we're right alongside all of the legit podcasters. <laughs> they let us in. We're in the club. Feels good. So if you guys are interested, grab it on iTunes, all of the places that we just mentioned, and you can listen to it on the go whenever you want. Yay, us. All right, but we have a panel of people to talk to today, don't we? We do. I'm excited. Um, in the interest of spreading my Mozilla propaganda, I invited two of my teammates to join us today to talk about a really important subject, debugging. Um, the first one that I'll introduce is Jason Laster, who's sort of the lead engineer on the Firefox DevTools debugger, the guy that's been around uh, the longest working on the new one. How's it going, Jason? It's going well. Awesome. And with me, we have the newest person on the team, Logan Smith, who has to work around all the, the creepy, difficult stuff on the Firefox server <laughs> side so that the debugger can communicate with Firefox. And he's also one of the maintainers of Babel. How's it going, Logan? Oh, it's going really well. Happy awesome. to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, now, usually, we talk about the news right now. But in the interest of it being Valentine's Day, I think we should spread some love and talk about who in the community we want to show some love for whatever reason. I'll go first. Um, I want to show some love to the DevTools debugger community. Um, to say that they're amazing is an understatement. I'm waking up every day to new code, new features, and the worst complaint that I can ever have is that I'm doing a ton of reviews, but that means a lot of awesome stuff is going into Firefox. Um, so I want to thank everybody there. I also want to thank um, three people, Ray Bango, Dylan Sheeman, and Mike Morgan, all of whom brought me from a small print shop in Madison, Wisconsin, to the heights, to the castle of Mozilla. Um, I'll never forget what they've done to me, and that means the world to me. So I want to show that love. Uh, how about you, Todd? Um, I, have a, I have a couple. Uh, first, you know, I'm not directly affiliated with the Mozilla organization at all, but you know, MDN is my jam, right? Like when I don't understand JavaScript, and that's pretty often that I don't understand JavaScript, you know, that's what I search. Like, so the Mozilla Development Network is amazing, all the details about all the things. But when that's not good enough, or when the docs of a site that I'm using are failing, like when I'm trying to figure out how Firebase works and it just won't, Google. Google and Stack Overflow has all of the answers. Like, I honestly, if Stack Overflow goes down, development stops in the known universe. And finally, Twitter, when everything is ragey and people on the internet are wrong, that's where you can go and tell them so if you really <laughs> want to. That doesn't sound like spreading love to me, but I'll... Uh, I'll I, it's not love to the people on the internet. It's love to Twitter for giving me the vehicle to tell the people on the internet. <laughs> 
I wasn't expecting that one. Logan, <laughs> how about you? Do you? Is there anyone you want to share some, some love to? Oh, man. I mean, time? clearly I'm spreading the love to my wonderful coworkers right now. But uh, beyond <laughs> that, um, let's see. I don't know. I think, uh, I don't know. I have a lot of love for good meetups, I guess. Like, I think a lot of meetups are a little bit bland. They kind of just like general presentations. But I think a good meetup where people are excited and chatting about technology and, like, excited to be there uh, is great. So, like, last night I went to... Waffle JS and had a wonderful time here in San Francisco, which is just a meetup that's like super focused on, I don't know, just fun little uh, quirky, like quick presentations and then just chatting with people who are all kind of like happy to be there and excited about JavaScript. And I don't know, there's a lot to be said for that. Awesome. How about you, uh, Jason? I know you've got love for everybody, but who's. who's <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'll second the love of the debugger community. They are so much fun to be around and inspire me and, and challenge me. They're collectively way smarter than I am <laughs> and individually. Um, yeah, also second, Ray Bango. Yeah. Um, he When I got started working on open source, I was working on Marionette.js, which is a project that Derek Bailey started. And uh, when I got to know Ray Bango, he was like, did you know I was Derek Bailey's manager and enabled that work, <laughs> give him the space to do it. So. Ray Bango is a great uh, shout back, um, throwback, I guess. I also want to thank uh, and give appreciation for Nicholas Sakos, who helped create Acorn and ESLint. And ESLint recently uh, went on the Open Collective um, bandwagon and is looking to be uh, somewhat sustaining and a great project support. And lastly, every chance I get, I try to promote AST Explorer which is the nerdiest um, <laughs> <laughs> of projects, but um, has made Babel and, and Acorn, I guess, parsing accessible for me and others by visualizing the output of the parser um, or the transform, by showing you what uh, it creates, the AST, the abstract syntax tree. And it's just a wonderful project and is, is made it usable and Everyone should take a minute and just look at that. It's fun. Yeah, I've looked. You've uh, evangelized that to me before, and it's a massive help in trying to visualize things that can be difficult to understand without something to visualize it. Cool. So we've got three people from the Firefox DevTools debugger team here, which means that we have to talk about debugging, right? Um, one of the things that really inspired me to join the team with you, Jason, um, was that. You had mentioned at one point that you felt like debugging was like your life's work, or at least this debugger, right? Especially um, in the in the the realm of Mozilla, um, and and like I said, I found that really inspiring. Um, in sort of understanding why we need to debug, like, can you sort of talk about why you think debugging is so important, or why why you're so passionate about it? Sure. Um, <laughs> so maybe I should start off by just. Uh, clarifying, I think the term debugging is terrible. <laughs> um, and I don't feel like debugger as a tool takes a name from the act of debugging, which I feel is a negative spin. Um, like The way I like to think about it is we all enjoy creating things. And we want to understand our creation and how it works. And to the extent of which uh, we have tools to help us visualize uh, the control flow and data flow in our application and, and how it works, that's so important. Um, there's nothing better for me than feeling like I can create something and it's just working. I'm in the zone and I'm in the flow. And there's nothing worse when I feel like I can't and I have no control over the environment. So if we can build tools that make us feel awesome, that just is amazing. And I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> well, we're getting closer, right? And when you say we're not there yet, you guys are all super young. But a dinosaur like myself <laughs> didn't have any debugger You know, when I first started with the web. And that was roughly 20 years ago, right? When I was 14, I was trying to figure out how any of this stuff worked, um, mostly copying and pasting off of sites that look good. Um, we had nothing. I had nothing but view source, <laughs> right? And the first time that I ever touched a debugger of any kind, I think was Visual Basic. 
Mm. like like in college, right? And it was sort of, it was a big moment for me, not coding Visual Basic, that, that was also a low moment. But the fact <laughs> that, you know, it, I finally started to understand that there are like languages and stuff out there that wanted to help us fix the problems that we were running into mm. um, instead of reload and pray, right? <laughs> and so I think that, I think that's another reason why I've been inspired to to work at work on the debugger, but not just work on it, but to use it more and to really understand how we can help people um, solve these types of problems. Yeah. So, like, what are the what are the web what are the web debugger debuggers that we have available now? Is it just limited to like browser? you know, dev tools debuggers, or is is there more out there for us to use, do you think? Hmm. I am certainly inspired by some of the work that VS Code is doing um, around remote debugging. Uh, they're getting closer and closer to the IDE environments. Um, and I, I and kudos to Chrome and, and, and the other browsers to us uh, for making that possible. Uh, so you can have those extensions. Um, yeah. So I think we should go around and mention a few of the really hard bugs that we've had to use the debugger to figure out. Um, one of the like really cool parts of working on the debugger is that we can actually use the Firefox DevTools debugger to debug the Firefox DevTools debugger. <laughs> That's always really fun. But I'll kick <laughs> off with you, Todd. You ship you know, JavaScript to sites all around the world, huge traffic. Um, like, what are some of the bugs that, that you've run into during that time? Well, before before I was doing the Trek.js thing, I was a consultant and I worked on lots of different apps for all kinds of different companies. And that's where some of the most interesting um, bugs that I ever ran into came in. Um, because when you deal with complex systems like the web, there's all kinds of moving pieces. Some of them you control and some of them you don't, right? Like JavaScript is a language you can, you, you write your app and it's running, but like there's also networks that are involved with that can, you know, manipulate how data gets sent sometimes and they can like screw with you the headers and change timings on you in all kinds of unpredictable ways. And then it runs in all kinds of different browsers that kind of get like manipulated and, and like, users install plugins or they use weird things or all, all there's all kinds of different things that can go wrong which is what makes javascript i think particularly hard to debug compared to a lot of other environments uh, but before before i was working on on that specifically i was still building websites um and i was debugging this app that would run on an older phone. This was a number of years ago, and it was this old Android device. And we were building this little web application that would run on this old, this old Android device. And nothing worked on it. Like you would write JavaScript and it would work great in Firefox. It would work great in Internet Explorer. It would work great in Chrome. It worked great everywhere, except on this one device. The, the only device that it really needed to work on, <laughs> it would not work on it. And it was using like Android browser to something. I don't even remember the version. It was just, it was just awful. And there was like really no way to debug it. Like hmm. the like the the remote debugging game was not strong uh, at the time. I would argue it's still not particularly strong on a lot of mobile devices. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so we built basically an early, early version of TrackJS for this phone. This is before like it, it had any kind of concept. It's like, basically it was this little JavaScript we were injecting that wrote this little UI onto the page that allowed you to like see what the values of variables and stuff were just on the phone. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of click on things. It's like, it was like rendering Firebug back in the day. It was like rendering a very simple version of Firebug into the UI so that you could understand what it was doing. And honestly, I don't even remember what the ultimate bug was. I'm sure it was like some API on Android browser, whatever, that didn't behave like I thought it would. Uh, but what was interesting was the tooling we built around it, it just to solve the bug. Is we probably spent two or three days of engineering time building this remote debugger 
to understand mm. the problem. That sounds like, oh man. <laughs> <clears throat> um, clients, yeah, clients are usually super enthused to uh, pay for that engineering time. But no, like the, it's, it, you gotta do what you gotta do to get by. And I'm glad you mentioned Firebug because for the longest time, that was really one of the most reliable tools that you had. Um, Logan, you've seen some pretty sticky stuff in your <laughs> time at Mozilla. <laughs> but, um, like what are some of the things that you've been able to use the debugger for to uh, solve solve those problems? Oh man, let's see. I mean, honestly, I think half of the stickiest bugs are the ones that are more like C++. Uh, <laughs> but um, oh, man, I mean, I think on the debugger side, it's really like, it's always the bugs where there's timing issues or like you're, you know, having race conditions and things, especially, you know, if you're sending stuff to be processed by workers and things like that, and then you end up with race conditions between all the different threads or, you know, things where, you know, you've dispatched a million different messages and then you have to wait for them all to come back and like everything kind of either grinds to a halt or races each other. Uh, stuff like that's always the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Async is hard, right? Yeah. It, JavaScript is wonderful in so many ways around async, but boy, does it make debugging and understanding the flow of data hard. Uh, you know, I mean, we've all been talking about this a lot in the last couple of weeks, just like the biggest problem, or not biggest, but a problem that we always have in the debugger is, you know, managing async flow of data, just like when various actions and things are happening, if you're interacting with the UI and something was going on already in the background, like how do you, Mm. figure out when things are competing with each other or racing, uh, you know, if the UI is updated and then some older request that you sent, you know, two minutes ago that was slow comes in, do you update the UI with that kind of stuff? And that's always the, a huge pain too. It, it's not just a pain to solve it, but sometimes just even identifying it is, yeah. is the hardest part. Or you get random tests that are just flaky for unclear reasons, and then you know someone yells at you like, "Oh, this test has <laughs> failed!" You know, two percent of the time. So it's not very useful and not specific, but you know that something weird is going on. And flaky yeah. tests are, have always kind of been the bane of my existence at various jobs <laughs> that I've had. So, right, and and that sort of even gets magnified within Firefox, right, where people are touching stuff outside of the debugger that affect what you're doing. And that's something that we've yep. seen quite a bit of. Yeah. Um, or you have the opposite problem and uh, running the debugger makes the bug not happen. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a Heisen bug or Schroeder <laughs> bug? <laughs> Do you remember the old problem with like Internet Explorer 8 and, and 9 where like console.log didn't exist unless you had oh, yeah. the console open. open and so you'd yeah. like you'd like no. fill you'd like fill your your app with like logging debugging statements to try and understand what was going on and but like it would just blow up and and then you'd be like well what's going on you finally pop up on the console and like everything is there it looks fine there's there's yep. no problem here you close the console everything dies again <laughs> that's brutal yeah Speaking of brutal, Jason, I've seen you go after some pretty brutal bugs in, in, <laughs> in the past. Are there any notable ones that you should mention that the debugger got you through or caused you the pain of? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um... Didn't you at one point have to use, didn't you reach the third level of inception of debugging the <laughs> debugger with the debugger? Uh, many times. Uh, it's definitely confusing when you see uh, DevTools running locally. Um, and then, of course, like that's what we do. We, we open up DevTools to inspect it. Um, and you've got the debugger on the right, and you've got the, the debugger debugging it on the left. Um, a case that it's, it's so interesting. I've found the biggest challenge with async is there's a chronology, right? Like one thing happens, and then another thing happens. And if they're out of order, you're in trouble. Um, or you're waiting for something. And the debugger is really good at pausing at any one of those times and seeing what's pending in the state of the world. Um, and with logs, you can view what's been fired before that and get an idea. Um, the most frustrating thing for me is when you finally reproduce it. And you're like, OK, now I have a debugging session. I'm going to look at this point, 
I'm going to resume and I'll look at this point and resume and look at this point. And then you get to the end and you're like, I kind of get it, but I'm not really sure. I, I, I want to look at that second thing again or that first thing again. But like, how are you going to do that? Like maybe in the console, you've logged everything and you're happy and you can just look at that. But often going through and marching through it, you're like, I want to know more. I want to see that second point again. And you've got like two options. Uh, one is think really, really hard about it and try to like visualize in your head and you could be wrong. And the second option is like try to do it again and pause at that second point and maybe uh, you'll get that information. Um, I mentioned this because recently we've been working on this ability to just rewind to that second point. And as soon as you can rewind to that second point and then in the debugger see it, you're like, oh, yeah, I was totally wrong about this thing. <laughs> and I've been using this technology, and I've fixed a couple bugs, and it's just so satisfying because it takes like the hardest class of problems and then makes them trivial. So we have this bug that I was looking at yesterday where you know when you hover on a variable and it shows you a pop-up? You're like, oh, that's the value. OK, cool. Under the hood, you hover, and we're like, OK. What do we want to evaluate? And then we go to the browser and we try to evaluate it. And then we come back and we show you the result. But in the meantime, you might have moved your mouse. In fact, you likely did, because like people move their mouse a lot. <laughs> and we're right. constantly trying to preview things. And that causes some issues around um, what we show. And if you move it really fast, we could like show we all like leave the yellow highlight box behind. And then all of a sudden, you, you accumulate these yellow boxes if you're moving it really aggressively in the wrong scenario. Classic. And that's like the perfect async bug where like we should have just cleared that thing, but we didn't. And being able to rewind to the time when like we accidentally didn't clear it and then see it, that's everything. Because at that point, you have so much metadata about what's going on that it's almost impossible to capture all of that preemptively with logs. Totally. And this is the infamous web replay feature that's currently baked inside of Firefox. Oh, yeah. Being able to rewind something, not easy. <laughs> that, yeah, that was, a huge, that, was a, <laughs> that was a huge effort. Um, and let's talk web replay in a second. But I want to take a quick step back. I have two people who know the, fire, the server of the DevTools debugger mm -hmm. really well. And I think that. One thing that would be cool is to describe to people how exactly the debugger works, right? Um, we know that uh, we've explained before that there's a, a client side, and that's essentially the UI, and it hooks into the server side of Firefox. So Logan, starting with the server, could you explain how exactly, at a very high level, how exactly the, the debugger sort of works and talks to the client side? Let's see. So how, the, how it talks to the client. Um, yeah, I mean, the server exposes you know, a, basically a few relatively straightforward APIs that allow you to say, you know, say things like, oh, you know, pause at the next breakpoint or whatever, add breakpoints, and the server will then watch kind of the execution going on in the page. Um, and then you know, it'll basically let the client know if, it, if a breakpoint has been hit or if you, you know, run across a JavaScript uh, debugger, <laughs> run across a JavaScript debugger statement, then um, you know it knows. Oh, like there's a debugger open, and people want to stop here, so it'll send a message to the client saying, you know, oh, I paused uh, because we hit this statement. Um, and I mean, you know, it goes so much deeper than that as things kind of go along. But that's, I guess, the high level view of it. Uh, is the server is just like always watching what's going on from the engine. And, how uh, can how can things how can a browser just like pause and things just not end up breaking or something? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things when you that you don't necessarily think about when pausing, right? Like, you need to pause the overall JavaScript execution, but still at the same time, then run the logic to kind of watch the page, I guess, and like handle the debugging things. Like, if you think about it, when you're paused in the debugger, you can still ex execute things in the console. Um, like David, or like Jason mentioned, when you're hovering over things, we like evaluate the value of variables and things. So it's not that it's all paused, but it's that like the page you're looking at is paused, and only the debugger is allowed to touch things, and that makes it a lot more complicated because we've 
as I guess we've all heard, um, like this big ongoing project that has for the Firefox debugger has been these issues of basically the places where we didn't pause properly, uh, which is like, you know, up until now, um, if you pause in the debugger, but you know maybe there was a promise that was queued up or something like that, some of that code would still run, and like wasn't paused properly, uh, and that's been, I guess, a weird issue. Like if you have uh, an XHR that you've started and then you hit a debugger statement, then like onload callbacks from that XHR might still run, and that kind of breaks the semantics of JavaScript. So like, so this is like is the hard. worst thing in the world, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it took me so long to internalize. Basically, like, if when the debugger paused, we were to truly pause, all of Firefox would pause. You want to, like, click in the URL bar? Sorry, that's JavaScript. That ain't <laughs> running. You want to, like, change tabs? Nope. You go to another tab somehow? Sorry, that's also paused. <laughs> um, how do we get around that? How do we only pause content? Um, yeah, and so we kind of, right now, if you think about it right from the standpoint of JavaScript, we have a single thread of execution. And so what happens right now is JavaScript will be running its event loop um, that, that kind of handles everything in the page that you're looking at. And so that might then you know, run some JavaScript or hit a debugger statement. And the server itself has to then start what's called a nested event loop, which uh, at means it's basically the cause of those other weird issues that I mentioned where things still get processed even when you're paused, uh, which is that uh, we have this nested event loop that's basically blocking. It's just like you know if you were spinning a loop forever. So the kind of code that is being debugged never runs because you're looping forever kind of logically. And so you're actually running an event loop inside of the process or inside of the JavaScript that was already running to stop it from running. Um, and that was something that when I started, I, I also was like a big question for me of like, how does that work? Like, I had no idea. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of fascinating. Um, so that lets me click in the debugger UI, and that click goes in the top level event loop. Is that right? Well, I guess that's a special case, too, because the debugger UI, I think, runs in its own thread, oh. doesn't it? But the server that the UI ah. is talking to is running inside that nested event loop. So that nested event loop, okay. in theory, you basically want that event loop to only get events that are related to the experience of debugging the page and nothing about the actual content in the page running. But then you get into questions of, you know, oh, if you run something in the console, should we get events related to what you ran in the console inside the debugger? Oh, uh, yeah. Or do we delay those events? related to the console execution until after you hit resume again. When this you're reminds me of a uh, fun question where we had a bet and I lost the bet and you won it. <laughs> if you're and maybe I'll pose it to the entire audience. And I wish we could do a straw poll right now because I would love to see the results. But if the debugger is paused and you go to the console and you type set timeout arrow function console log comma twelve or whatever, right? Will you get the log? Or are we paused and that timeout's never going to run? Same thing with fetch. Same thing with anything async. Do we expect that to resolve? And I was like, of course it does. And it doesn't. <laughs> it just doesn't. Todd, I think you're starting to see why I'm a front end UI guy. And I leave the real hard problems to the really smart people because. One of the funny things that Jason told me when I started on the debugger was, OK, David, don't tell any of the other dev toolers this. I'm totally exposing us right now. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, the debugger is the most complex dev tool we have. And as you start seeing these layers of, um, we just added um, multi, or I don't know if the, the correct term is, but adding multiple threads, um, being able to pause between the multiple threads within one debugger. Um, the layers of complexity, I mean, just pausing itself sounds like an incredibly complex thing to do. Um, the levels of complexity that we need to accommodate for um, on the server and on the client side within the UI, it's incredible. Um, Don't sell the UI short. This is a hard UI to build sure. and build correctly. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Absolutely, oh. but but my my brain froze when Logan was talking all of that complex <laughs> stuff. Because, no, yeah, it's, oh. it's really you're fun. you're absolutely right. Like UIs are way harder than a lot of people give them credit for. Absolutely. Like, when we're building out a feature, like in at TrackJS, like we'll like conceive of like what data we want on the report and whether or not it's feasible for us to get it, and we'll put together a really ugly looking you know proof of concept page that says, "Oh, right, can we get it? Can we get it fast enough for big customers? Can we get it fast enough for small customers?" Customers, all kinds of stuff, and then that that work is usually the fastest bit of development time, and mm -hmm. then and then we spend probably two or three times that again saying, okay, now how do we want to actually like show this UI that a developer can look at it and understand what we're talking about and intuitively you know learn something from the report. And I think that has a lot of echoes with the debugging tools of just having this capability isn't isn't valuable if the developer can't understand what's happening through the metaphors in the UI that you present back to them. And yeah. so I think that's really, really important. So I think a debugger, let's say we're building a debugger for Python and a nice UI for that. In some ways, this could have been a really easy problem or a really easy project, but JavaScript's complicated and, and the reasons for that. Um, when you pause in Python, you will likely get the call stack that you want. Um, and that first frame will tell you where you're paused. And you can show that code, highlight the line and location where you're paused. And in some ways, you're done. <laughs> if you hit next, you should clear the current pause information and ask the server uh, to tell you when you pause again. Um, it's kind of like your classic reactive application. JavaScript with source maps makes everything harder. So what we do, and, and Chrome does half of this, um, but we really care about source maps. Uh, so we do more of it. Uh, the first thing we ask when we're paused is, is this a place where we actually want to be paused at? Um, if you're using Babel and you have, let's say, default uh, parameter values, or you're using like this destructuring, Babel's going to create a lot of code in that function to do that work for you. And what we see when we're paused is that we're inside of the function's arguments. Now, in a normal language, like, you should not ever be paused in the function signature. Like that's not a valid pause location. So. We do all that async work, decide whether we should be paused. And if we decide we shouldn't be, then we execute a step over for you. And that will continue stepping until you leave all the Babel code. So that's like the first thing we do. Once we've decided we're in a valid pause location, then we take the call stack and we go to the source map worker and we say, can you get us the source map in a friendly format in the original code? Mm -hmm. And we map and then drop all the dead frames. So we show you just the original call stack. We're like, great, now the users see the JavaScript that they wrote and not maybe the call stack from the bundle code and all the, the generated stuff. So like, we've cleaned up that mess, which is like, OK, I, I joke with Logan about this, but I can joke about it publicly. That's the <laughs> second Babel problem. <laughs> we love Babel, <laughs> but we've just had to fix two problems for Babel and like the larger Webpack ecosystem. Sure. Third thing we do, and this is perhaps the craziest, uh, we look at the variables in the variable pane and we say there are 10 scopes that we're told about. And the variables in there all reference, and reference code that's in the bundle that maybe Webpack created and maybe Babel created like tons and tons of intermediate variables. And that's a mess. Users never want to go into like the third scope and look at underscore Webpack, underscore module, dot A, dot default, dot getter, whatever, just to get that one variable that they're looking for. And so um, what we do is we parse both the original code that we, we fetched from the source map and the generate code, like that giant bundle. So we create two versions of the AST and the entire scope chain. And then we use source maps to figure out the original variables and scopes that the users actually want to see. This is, by the way, what Logan worked on for the first half of last year, like six months of insane hacking on the language <laughs> level to figure out semantic source maps. And then we show that information. And by the way, 
once we're done with all that, we're still not done. We still have to like evaluate watch expressions and do other stuff. So there's a lot there. And if the user at any point in one accepting, I want to resume, we need to cancel all that stuff, which is where like some of the async and, and race conditions come from. So there's a lot that we try to do on the client to make it easier to debug something. And it's all super important, but it creates complexity uh, in the UI that you might not expect. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I have to admit this. I was a serial console.logger for a very long time. Um, and I think that I was that way because I would say 75% of the time that would get me what I needed. And it also, it gave me like a nice audit trail of stuff to look at. Um, but as I started to run into more complex problems, I forced myself to use the debugger. Um, and looking back, I asked myself like, why didn't I jump to the debugger sooner? And I came away with a, a bunch of reasons, right? And hopefully the reasons that we can improve upon. Number one, um, a debugger is yet another tool in your sort of on the, on the job that you were never really taught to use, right? You, there were classes about how to learn new languages, um, you know, classes about database stuff. There's never really a concerted effort into teaching how to use specific tools. And that can take a while. Um, the other thing is that async coding came along. And as you guys have all mentioned, that made debugging way harder because there could be so much going on. Um, the other part of it is that, you know, sometimes using a debugger seems a little slow or cumbersome, just in like step, 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 play, step, step, step. And, you, and if you're anything like me, you just want to solve a problem really, really quickly. So I guess like what I try and think about beyond creating a nice UI is like, how can we make the debugging experience better? How can we make it enjoyable and not a slog? And like part of what gets me excited about working on the new debugger is all of the awesome new features that we have coming, the ones that I can promise people um, right now. Did you guys want to introduce some of the new stuff that, that we have coming into the debugger that people are going to be able to use um, either in Nightly right now or in upcoming Firefox? That'd be great. Let's do it. Um, the first one that I want to mention is XHR breakpoints. So a lot of times, you know, all applications are using a billion AJAX requests these days. Um, and especially if you're a REST developer, being able to debug given uh, requests or pause on given requests is incredibly helpful. Um, so I'm super grateful for our community, um, Angela and Jareel, who actually put that feature together. Um, they did an incredible job. Um, one of the other ones that I'm super excited about that I'm going to force Logan to talk about is the breakpoint specificity effort <laughs> that, we've begin to, uh, that we've begun to push. Did you want to sort of describe uh, how that comes into play? Yeah. Um, so I guess we've been going through this big effort to improve essentially the quality of the breakpoints uh, in the debugger and figure out, I guess, how best to have kind of the JavaScript engine tell us where you are and aren't allowed to break. Um, up until now, essentially, the JavaScript engine has given us like a ton of places that we could pause at. and. Some of them kind of logically made sense, and some of them didn't. Um, and we had a whole ton of logic written that would basically run uh, in the debugger client side, like outside of the JavaScript engine entirely, um, to decide like which points we actually cared about. So if you hit a point, and then we said, oh, actually, we don't care about this one, so don't bother stopping on it. Um, I should say this is, I guess, related to kind of two parts, which is one, just like if you're in the debugger and you say, uh, you know, if you pause somewhere and you say next, like what is the next thing that you are going to? Um, it's not always clear, and the, it's up to the debugger to decide. Um, and up until now, that has been kind of all over the place. Um, similarly, for our work on column breakpoints now, so if you have, you know, you eventually want to be able to click on a line and see a bunch of different markers on all the different places you can logically put a breakpoint. Um, and that's a project that we've been working on, and we kind of you know, realized that we didn't actually know 
uh, all the right places or you know how best to uh, I guess translate those back and forth uh, and so this uh, I guess what we've been calling breakpoint specificity which is an incredibly vague name uh, <laughs> is basically teaching uh, the JavaScript engine in Firefox what I guess the an idea of, or a concept of breakpoints that is more in line with what we actually want uh, from the debugger side of things so it's very nice to have kind of really low level primitives from like an a general uh, standpoint of having and implementing a debugger, but that doesn't translate well to a user interface. And so having this better kind of UI centric concept in there as well is going to be a huge plus for, you know, we've talked about it for column breakpoints uh, and stepping mostly, but then that kind of propagates out to a few other places uh, where having a firm column and line number for everything will be a huge plus. So. Totally. Can and I know I, that was a huge effort. Go ahead, Jason. I just have to ask, because you went through that entire description without mentioning bytecode, which is really impressive. <laughs> but if, as a user, I click in the gutter on a certain line, like line 10, um, that's creating a breakpoint in the engine. How does the engine, how did the engine decide where we're going to pause on line 10 before and now after? Yeah, so I guess uh, Spider Monkey is Firefox's JavaScript engine. And it's, uh, I guess, what's called a bytecode interpreter or a bytecode, I guess, virtual machine. And then an interpreter is one piece of it anyway. Um, and that means that kind of conceptually, It'll take a JavaScript function and then split it into a ton of little instructions that are executed step by step. Um, and then you know those might then be optimized later by the compiler or not to make the code actually run fast. Um, but kind of the part that's exposed to the debugger is this concept of uh, individual byte codes. And so the engine will go through executing them one at a time. Um, and in Spider Monkey. Uh, each of those ends up with a position assigned to it. And so up until now, essentially, whenever you've clicked on a line, we'd do either one of two things, which is add, a, add I guess, a kind of logical breakpoint to like everything that was tagged as a location on that line, which is very frustrating in a lot of ways, um, which is an, a huge motivation for why we're actually doing column breakpoints and stuff now is we want to be very specific about where we're adding breakpoints. Um, and so, yeah, this project has been, I guess, being more careful about what individual bytecodes uh, we treat as like valid uh, breakpoints and points where you can step to as you're hitting resume and stepping to the next instruction. Yeah. Yeah, the column breakpoint effort has been a lot of fun. And I think that people are really going to enjoy it. Um, another thing that I know that Jason, you've been super excited about has been log points. Would you like to share yeah. how that works or, or what people can look forward to seeing soon? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a funny way to describe it. My, when I talk to people, sometimes, you know, being a debuggy kind of person, debugger, debuggy, I like to test people on their knowledge of the arcane and specific uses of debugging. And one of my favorite tests would be, how do you use conditional breakpoints? Well, do you know what a conditional breakpoint is? A and B, what are your use cases? And the typical use case, if you know about conditional breakpoints is, sometimes I want to pause, sometimes I don't. If I'm in a loop, maybe I only want to pause when I is three, and that's it. I don't want to pause when I is one or two or four. Um, the other use case, for uh, conditional breakpoints is I want to inject code while the program's running. I want to run code when the program's running, which is interesting and maybe malicious, but that's fine. You're only hurting yourself. And the best use of um, code injection that I've known of is I want to log whenever this breakpoint said. I don't want to pause. I just want to log. So I'm going to put console.log something in my condition. It's going to log that thing. And by the way, console.log returns null, undefined, it's false, whatever. Uh, therefore, we're not going to pause. Um, I found that maybe one out of 10 people had passed that test in the past. And that's probably disappointing <laughs> uh, for a really nice use case. 
So what we did was uh, we made logging from a breakpoint much easier. So now when you right click um, in the gutter, you're prompted to add a log point. Or if you right click on a, a breakpoint, you're prompted to add a log. And when you do that, you see a little input, and then you could type something, and that goes right into console.log and is logged immediately. And why would we think people could do that? Um, the main reason is you're already in the debugger, you're already running things, and you just want to start logging, and you don't want to like, spend the time to go to your editor, add a, some code like console.log, and then refresh and rerun it. So this is just like a direct way of inputting it. Or you don't actually control the third-party script that you're trying to yeah. get, a, get a log from. Absolutely. Well. That's that really nice. huge if you're debugging CNN.com. Huge. Absolutely. Uh, and the last one that I have to mention, or Jason will beat me up, is Web Replay. You mentioned, you mentioned how you've been using it to solve complex bugs before. I am so glad you asked. <laughs> 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 All right. So Web Replay is the, the code name for being able to record a tab at the lowest level, like at the system call level, and then deterministically run forward or run back, like play that recording. And the way I think about it is being able to have a recording um, in real time while you're debugging makes everything better. Because if you've been trying to reproduce that thing and you just reproduced it and it's interesting, now you can analyze it after the fact. So if we use that log points example, um, you finally got preview to fail or that thing that you're debugging to fail. And instead of like going to your editor and adding a bunch of console logs and then trying again to get it to fail, just go to your debugger, add a log point, And what we're going to do is scan the recording for you and log all those things that you just added as a log point. Every time that breakpoint said, we're going to log it, and your console is going to immediately update. So it's the first example that we have of you basically being able to query your recording and visualize the output after the fact logging. Um, and if something's interesting to you, just click on that log, so from the console, and you're going to jump back and rewind back to that point. You're going to navigate to that point. And if something else is interesting to you, you can add another log point and then jump there. So you get this immediate uh, ability to play with your recording. Um, and and not, on, not only play with it, but share it, right? So you're not trying to you write down these weird steps to repeat. You can give someone the recording and say, this will reproduce the thing. Yeah, I just send it to you. And you're pretty good at this. So you start annotating the recording so that the timeline shows all the things that you found. You're like, yo, that seems weird. Why was that run? And then I can go and look and vice versa. And that's this is, uh, I think it's fair to say that this is in pretty early stages. But is there a way that people can turn this on in Firefox to try it out? Yes, and we would love that. Um, download Firefox Nightly. And then if you go to About Config, which is where we have all the good stuff, <laughs> and search MVP, you'll find our future flag. We're the only ones who have a MVP. Um, but uh, you turn that on, and then you'll see a little record button in DevTools. And uh, start playing with it, and let us know what, what you think. Yeah. It's also just worth mentioning that at the moment, that only works on OS X. Uh, yes, thank so. you. Why does it only work on OS X? Because we're recording the system call output, <laughs> which is insane. Who would have thought this could work? <laughs> um, Better to get it working on one system first and then go right. implement the rest afterwards. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Awesome. Well, speaking of the MVPs, Todd, you're the host MVP. What are your takeaways <laughs> from this episode on debugging? Uh, I will have to say that I am one of the nine out of 10 people who never put it together in my head that I could use a conditional breakpoint for a log. <laughs> and that is brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to use that all the time now. Like, that is such a good idea. And it just had never occurred to me. So, like, and, that, and that'll work in Firefox, but it'll also work in like Chrome or Safari or anywhere you can use a conditional breakpoint. You could drop a console log in there that will return undefined. And so it won't actually break, but you could log things. That's great. I love it. Awesome. Um, I th I'll go next. I think that my biggest takeaway is that I've been on the debugger team for roughly a year now. And 
you think by now I would feel like I understand everything better, but the more I listen to Logan and Jason <laughs> talk about the server side of things, I get more and more mind blown about everything that goes into being able to pause now, freeze things, be able to inspect values and such. To me, I, as, as a UI guy, I find that to be incredible. And I'm incredibly happy that I'm not the primary person responsible for doing that work because it <laughs> sounds mind blowing. So that's my takeaway. Jason, did you have any takeaways? Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I'll go back to something we said early on, but for me, I am blown away by having so many smart people around us. Uh, the fact that at the same time, we could uh, find a way to be specific about where we pause. We can fix the UI and work with a community of people to improve every aspect of it. We can work on the nested event loop so we, we don't pause when, we're, when promises are running, or we, we make the, the promises pending until we've resumed. Everything here is interesting, and the fact that we can build this better tool for people is just inspiring. Awesome. Logan, how about you? Did you have any key takeaways from today? Um, man, <laughs> hard to go after Jason with that one. Um, <laughs> no, man, nothing specific. I don't know, just that like, I think it's all absolutely fascinating. And I don't know, I could talk about all this stuff for ages. Uh, so <laughs> I'm super glad that I've had the opportunity to join the team and uh, I guess contribute to making Firefox better. Awesome. Thanks for uh, joining us this week, guys. Uh, for Todd Gardner, TrackJS legend, and me, <laughs> David Walsh, we'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. <laughs>